I'd like to welcome you all to this evening's uh, talk. Um, we're very proud to, to have the incoming uh, uh, chancellor here of UCSD, uh, Dr. Pradeep uh, Kosla, speak. Uh, before I bring him up, I'd like to just take a minute to talk to you all a, a bit about, about TIE, uh, our events and our programs, and then we'll get this evening's event underway. Also, if you would, just mark your calendars uh, for uh, November. Uh, the Y'all, because you're, if you're registered for this event, you're on our email distribution list. But the next event here in November is on um, different ways entrepreneurs can access capital. So I'll we'll have a number of panelists, about four panelists will sit down and, and chat for a bit about angel investing, about the, the, uh, the various levels, the A round, B round, C round, you know, what were, were the VC, uh, VCs enter that picture where your friends and family do, where perhaps um, angels and, and, and the groups that, um, that support them, where they all come into play. It'll be a really interesting event. And look for that email distribution. And it's the fourth Tuesday of the month is when we typically hold our events, although we do occasionally move them to accommodate a speaker, as, as in this case. So let me talk to you a bit about Ty. So, Thai was formed um, about 1991, uh, it might be off by, it might be 1992, by a group of entrepreneurs in the Silicon Valley area. Um, they were from the Indus region, which is a river that runs through India and Pakistan, uh, and they got together to help foster entrepreneurship, and they did, decided to do that in about three ways, were through networking, uh, mentorship, and education. The, from that initial founding in Silicon Valley, Thai has grown to be six, to have 61 chapters, about 13,000 members, about 2,500 we call charter members, and we have a presence now in 17 countries. That uh, you know initial founding is still present. I think you'll you'll see in, in many of the uh, the members here and in, in, in the in the, the fine Indian food we serve. We've grown to be very you know inclusive. Uh, organization with a with a world worldwide presence, and very uh, very proud of that. the The way we've implemented the education is through these monthly events, but also in a program by the name of TYE Thai Young Entrepreneurs. One of the students and parents of that program is here tonight. That's a business plan competition for high school students. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful program. It, it's a um, we, 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 we typically begin that again this October. We've delayed that for a while and, and, and trying to decide if we can really implement that, that this year. Um, but it's, it's a wonderful program we have for, for high school students. Another one is a, a, a formal mentorship program. We also have a Thai Institute where we get down to the kind of the nuts and bolts of what it takes to get a business off the ground. We talk about topics uh, such as uh, the corporate structure, the organization, uh, a term sheet, what that should look like. So. Um, um, that's how we've really implemented the education program, the mentoring I've talked about, and then networking events like this. We always make sure we've, we have a fine Indian fair out there, and I love that chai tea, uh, and give plenty, everybody, everybody plenty of time to, to chat and, and get to know each other and, and build those relationships. I think so fundamental to, um, to finding resources for your company and, and, uh, and, and, and build relationships that perhaps you can leverage at some time uh, to find the resources you need to, to get your company off the ground. So, so that's really how ties uh, ties mission and how we implement that mission. Now, I mentioned the charter members. Now, charter members are um, seasoned entrepreneurs, often they're uh, corporate executives, but you know very established or certainly you know knowledge experts that have made the decision to give back and, and to mentor. And many of them are, are here tonight, uh, and they they run the organization. And I like to like, introduce a few of those. The first one we'll start with here is is Seren Dutia. I actually founded the Thai San Diego chapter. We're now the Thai South Coast chapter. We have Orange County uh, events as well. Uh, he's here this evening. Although I'm having a tough time seeing people. Here here is Seren. Go see you, Seren. Seren also spent uh, three years uh, uh, leading Thai Global, so running all the chapters in the organization. Uh, there are many other charter members here, and if you would, just so I can identify, if you would, just please go ahead and, and stand up, and then we'll kind of give an applause here at the end for them and the, and the time they give back. If you're a charter member, please just go ahead and stand up. Pr Pradeep, that would include you. <laughs> here we have uh, Pradeep Koso is also a charter member of Thai, and Nare Sony, and... Okay, I guess I won't go through all the names. We're already back down, but, but thank you very much. <laughs> okay, got a few of them. Thank you very much. So again, they've 
uh, you know, we have meetings once a month where we sit down and we plan our events, plan, plan logistics of the chapter. There, there is communication during the week. They actually put a great deal of time in, into this, um, into these monthly events. So, so I want to make sure we give them a round of applause and thank them because I think we have some really nice programs, but it takes their work to get it all done. But it also takes the work of one other person here, and I hope she is in the room, uh, Preeti? Just walked in, okay. She's the executive director of TIE. She's been here since its founding. And if you called with a question, she answered the phone. If you sent an email, she got that. But really, without her, none of this would happen. So we might come up with creative ideas, but when it comes to implementing it, uh, she, she's the one who makes it all happen behind the scenes. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Pretty, for all your hard work in the organization. The <clears throat> Now this is my last event here as president of the organization. Um, an individual I've known and, and have worked with here on TYE, uh, Dean Usen, uh, will he's the incoming president. So the next event he, he'll uh, he'll be up giving this talk. Um, and and Dino, would you please stand up? Okay, Dino Sen again is the incoming president of Thai. It's a it's a two year tour, and and uh, he'll. Um, <clears throat> we'll all support him, but they'll find out how much work there is during the week to make all these things happen. I think he's already learning that now. Um, well, good. I think that, that is the things I wanted to, to discuss here before we got this going. Now, the, the one thing the charter members help, help with is making the connections to people like uh, Dr. Uh, Pradeep Kosla. Uh, Naresh Soni is our charter member and member of executive committee having to make that, that connection and that uh, a nice Rolodex and, and, and help us uh, to, uh, to bring him in. And so I'd like to bring him up here now and um, to introduce our guest speaker tonight. Naresh. Thank you, Patrick. Today, I'm really gracious to introduce our chancellor of UCSD. He's, he's the eighth chancellor, Pradeep Kosla. He's not only a chancellor, but he is deeply an engineer, and also uh, he was a distinguished professor of uh, electrical and computer engineering. And uh, Pradeep, he has received several awards. He's been involved with uh, creating new research programs in his life. So without any further ado, Pradeep, please come and give us your thoughts. Thanks, Naresh, and thank you, Patrick. And thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, this is actually amazing. Usually meetings I go to where they serve dinner before the talk, the talk is empty. Uh, not that my talk won't be empty, but at least the audience uh, will be there, right? Uh, so I really appreciate you taking the time. I'm sure you have better things to do with your time, and I appreciate you being here. Uh, it's actually a great honor to be here. Patrick talked about me being a charter member. Um, I used to be, until I got here, a founding charter member of Thai Pittsburgh, and I can tell you it's an amazing organization. And if you're not a member of this organization, I think you should be. Uh, because uh, they do a lot of good things. And if you look at the current economy and the current state of where we are and the president's uh, initiatives on innovation, I think entrepreneurship is not the only solution, but it's one of the solutions. And Thai is clearly one of uh, the most entrepreneurial organizations uh, positioned to solve the problem and put this country in the right track. So please join me in thanking uh, Patrick uh, for his leadership and Preeti for her executive director because I think these guys are doing an amazing job. And Dino, I think you, I'm sure you'll do an amazing job. So let's just thank these guys before I start. <laughs> so the goal today, uh, I actually had no idea what is it that uh, Naresh wanted me to talk about. The only reason I'm here is because I thought there would be free dinner. Uh, <laughs> But then, this is day number 90 for me at uh, UCSD. And I can tell you in these 90 days, I've had like 450 meals, which is five per day. So I'm now at a point where I have to like cut down on these meals because I gotta lose some weight, otherwise I'll be dead, uh, right? Uh, but I say this with uh, a level of fondness because I think these meals were really with people who are really very committed uh, citizens of this uh, city and this town, 
uh, and the county. But more importantly, uh, even when they have no re relationship with UC San Diego, they've been so committed to the extent where if you look at our last campaign, which was a billion dollars, uh, we raised more than 95% of the money from people in this locality out here. And that tells you the respect and uh, the love with which they look at UC San Diego. Uh, and what I want to do is, uh, I want this to be more a conversation rather than me talking. So I'm going to take the next 15 minutes uh, to tell you why this love is justified. And I think it's the, this love is really justified because this is truly an amazing place. So some of you, I'm sure, have heard this before, and you might wonder, you know, why do you have to repeat how great you are? Um, well, every so often, I think one has to remind oneself uh, what a great gem we have. And especially me as chancellor, I have to do that. Otherwise, I don't get my paycheck at the end of the month. So trust me, you know, I have to make sure that I get my sales pitch right. But this is not a sales pitch. Even though it's 90 days, it's really heartfelt because I really believe uh, this place is truly amazing. That's the only reason I'm here. So this place is about 50 years old. And... Uh, so I want to talk to you a little bit about what has happened in these 50 years. Uh, it's going to be very quick. It's not going to be much detail. And I want most of the time to be spent on Q&A so that we can have an honest conversation of what I've learned and where I think uh, UC San Diego is going and the role it can play in the community out here. So talk a little bit about 50 years, a little bit about uh, what's changing in higher education. So all we hear about are the student debt issues, but in my mind that is an important issue, but that's not the only issue. A higher education, I think, in this country is up for a large upheaval, and it's not clear to me that we are ready for it. And then talk a little bit about uh, what are we doing at UC San Diego. This is not everything we are doing, uh, but this is some of the things we are doing, and hopefully your Q&A or your cues will prompt me to talk about other things I have on my mind. Uh, let's see, this somehow. <clears throat> Okay, 1960. So this is going to be a quick history, right, from a little military base, a little thing called Scripps uh, Institution of Oceanography, which actually even then was pretty well known. We are today one of the top campuses uh, in the world. We are ranked eighth uh, public university in the country, which is not a small feat, and we are ranked like number 15th in the world, and this is in a matter of 50 years. Now, 50 years may seem like a long time uh, in a human's life, but in a, in a university's life, institution's life, 50 years is pretty small. So Harvard is more than 200 years old. Uh, Stanford is more than 120 years old. And you can, Berkeley is more than 100 years old. So you can go down the, the list. Uh, 1960, uh, the goal, the, what we were looking at was climate research. And today we are one of the most uh, green campuses that I can think of. Uh, in this country, and actually I would say even in North America. So for example, we generate more than 90% of our electricity literally on campus. Uh, and a big percentage of that is through uh, solar cells. And if you just walk around campus, you will see solar cells on just about every parking garage, every flat surface we can find. And every time we have some money, we just put more solar cells and keep on generating our electricity. Uh, 1960, the way we were created was by recruiting top scholars. Uh, today, uh, we are the home to six Nobel laureates, uh, 150 members of the National Academies, which is the last bullet out there. And that is not quite insignificant because every year the National Academies pick like 55 members in engineering and maybe about 60 or so in sciences and maybe about 20 or so in medicine uh, to be elected. And we have 150 of them and we are number six on the list. And that is an amazing reputation, all in a matter of 50 years. Uh, 1960, we had, I don't know, a couple of hundred students total. Maybe 50 were graduate students. Uh, 2011, 2012, we are 30,000 students, out of which about 6,000 are graduate students. And if we face a challenge going forward, it is increasing the number of PhD students. And that is going to be, as I go through and talk about our strategic planning exercise, that's going to be a big focus because without a significant part of our population, I would say at least 25 or 30 percent being graduate students, I think we are not going to be positioned in a sustainable way to be one of the leading uh, institutions of higher learning in this country. Uh, 1960 based on this notion of innovation, collaboration, uh, 
across disciplines. In 2011, we have not only, uh, I'm about to say perfected this notion, but we have we understand how to make this seamless and better across the whole campus. So we do this extremely well in research uh, to the extent where we have a billion dollar research portfolio. So in case uh, you want to understand what billion dollar means, I'm not talking about how many dollar bills and how high, how high it would be, but we are number seven on the NIH funding list. This is the National Institutes of Health, which is actually a good indicator of your ranking. And we are number six on the National Science Foundation funding list. So we are way up there competing with the best of the best. Uh, and because of this billion dollar of research, we are totally, uh, UC San Diego is about $3.6 billion enterprise. Now, this number may not mean uh, much to you, especially if you're from a company and you look at uh, Qualcomm and you look at some other big companies, you say, ah, $3.6 billion is nothing. But I think what you want to think about is we get about $240 million from the state that we convert into $3.6 billion enterprise right here. Uh, so that's like a magnification of about 15 or so right there. And then that maps into about $7 plus billion of uh, uh, economic activity in the region. So there are thousands of jobs that are created because of UC San Diego. Uh, there are multiple companies, and I'll talk about that, that are created because of this. And the research we do changes the, li changes the lives of not only San Diegans, but of humanity across uh, the whole world, right? And we'll talk about that too. Uh, so there's about 650 companies that have been started in the last uh, I think about 30 years or so. It's not in the last 10 years, but it's actually a big number. Uh, I'll give you an example of where we are vis-a-vis -vis other UCs. Uh, 60s, an education and research center, and now we are literally a mini city. So to give you the size of this place, it's about 30,000 students who are on campus every day. There's 26,000 staff members who are on campus every day. That is 56,000 people right there. There's about a couple of thousand faculty, that's uh, 58,000. And there's about a few thousand, like two to 4,000 people who visit here every day. So that's about 60 plus thousand people. Most towns in this country don't have a population of 60,000. If you had a population of 60,000, you would be one of the top 100 towns in this country, literally, uh, right? So we are literally like a small city, uh, and we operate just, <laughs> just about every part of our infrastructure, and if we have challenges, and you kind of probably face them this evening, there's no parking out here, or, or if you are lucky enough to find parking, you would have to be luckier still to find this place. Right? So we still have some work to do, but we are getting there. Uh, we have an amazing health system. Our uh, UC San Diego Health Enterprise, our health, our hospital system, is top 10 in the country. Within that, some of the specialties are like top five in the country. Uh, and uh, our VC for Health, uh, he, David Brenner, has been doing a great job of selectively building uh, components in the health sciences, in the medical school, that really position us at the top. And this brings me to, so the reason we have become so good in such a short time is because even though we are a broad-based university, we don't do everything. We pick and choose. So for example, if you look at our music departments, top three in the country, you would not imagine a university that's known for its uh, sciences and engineering have a music department that's top three theater and dance, that is top five in the country. So our music department's top three because it does not cater to every type of music. It focuses purely on very contemporary, forward-looking avant-garde music. And so does, in a similar way, our department of uh, theater and dance, department of literature. I can go down the list. Point I'm trying to make is we pick and choose our battles, but once we choose the battle, we want to make sure we come out a winner at the other end. And just about everybody's DNA is literally trained uh, over time uh, to think that way. And uh, the place I come from, Carnegie Mellon, was uh, that way. So I can imagine that uh, this is really a perfect fit. So when I was thinking about moving here, I said, you know, this is the right place because I don't want to move to a public place. But if there was one public place I'd move to, it would be this place. And I said this to myself five years ago in a different context. It took five years for me to get this opportunity, but I'm glad it came, it, it get, it came to this point. Uh, this is also a campus which is uh, 
amazing in two other aspects. So, for example, uh, I have never seen a campus which has three playhouses, uh, three theaters on the same property, which has three top uh, uh, performance, like music performance uh, theaters, all on the same property. And we have all of these assets, and in spite of these assets, what we don't have is what I think of as a living and a learning community. And that lack of living in a learning community on this campus is really hurting us. It's hurting us in our uh, efforts in diversity. So when we have to go out and recruit students, we end up losing students to places like Santa Barbara, UCLA, UC Berkeley, uh, even UC Santa Cruz, because they are more embedded in a city slash town environment than we are. So if you are here on this campus and you got to get, I don't know, uh, pick something. If you're a graduate student who's married and you want to get diapers for your kids, there is no easy place unless you take a bus to some place and take some other bus to some other place and go two miles away. There is no place for you to really have a convenient uh, way of life. So thinking about ourselves as a living and a learning community, I think is the way of the future. And this is my view of what the campus should be thinking about. I think we should have our community members out here, not only coming to the Playhouse, coming to the Prebis uh, Music Theater, uh, coming to look at our art collection. We have, I think, one of the best art collections in the world with the Stuart Art Collection. I have never seen public art as good. Maybe Stanford. Uh, actually, I should give you that. Yes, yeah, Stanford has got good public art, but uh, maybe, but, but no other place that I can think of, right? So I want to think about the role of UC San Diego going forward, not just in the context of research, but in the context of our physical location, our acreage, our area that we occupy, and how can we make this a living and a learning community, uh, which is thriving 24-7. And so this is where I think somewhere along the line, I'm going to need your help, and I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, so what has changed? So the, so the whole UC system was founded on a compact between uh, the state and the UC, which basically said that we are committed to you, the UC, and in return for you offering the top, uh, the best education that you can in the world, we, the state, will commit to support you. And in that compact, we were expected to take 12.5% of all the top high school seniors that were graduating and make sure they got admission to UC. I think what that mapped into, and this compact is about 60 or 50 years old. It's a 1960, I believe. So this is about as old as UC San Diego is nearly. Um, and this has created what I think of as one of the best public education systems in the country, actually in the world. And where we are today, uh, in about 10 days, you're going to have a choice of voting for Prop 30 or not. And I can tell you, if you vote for Prop 30, uh, we would be like wearing a tourniquet, as in we would stop the bleeding, but uh, the patients would still be in a b bad state. If Prop 30 does not get approved, we would just hemorrhage to death, and that would be the unraveling of one of the best uh, public education systems built in the country, I think. Right? But that's not the point. I'm not asking you to do one thing or the other. You'll vote your conscience. But the point here is that... Uh, 240 million out of uh, 303.6 billion, we are about less than 7%, more like 6.5% of our budget comes from the state, and we are still expected to uh, fulfill a state mission. Uh, for the first time in our history, our students are paying more than what the state is giving us to support their education. And this is a total, uh, totally opposite of what was intended uh, when that education compact was created. And where we are right now, our funding is back to the 80s. So I'm not trying to complain. My view is this is just a state of life. This is just fact, just like the economy is bad. This is a bad situation. This situation does not mean that we're going to turn over and declare ourselves dead or go to sleep. What this means is we're going to have new ways of thinking about who we are, uh, what are we going to do, and what are we going to be when we grow up. And that is going to be the goal of the strategic planning exercise that we're going to start literally in about two weeks from now where we're going to define our future with or without the state funding. We're going to define our future uh, with or without any help uh, from the local community. 
Uh, we're going to define our future with significant invo involvement from our alumni. We're going to define our future and what we want to be in this community. So I believe that because we are in this community, uh, we are physically tied to this place. We cannot just get up and say, you know what, we are UC San Diego, we're going to go to Del Mar, or we're going to go to Carlsbad or whatever. We are in this community. We will be in this community. We plan to be in this community. So I think we do have to do everything that it takes to make this an extremely vibrant, impactful, and powerful community. And I think we've been doing that, but we want to do that with uh, a little bit more direct intent and a little bit more involvement from the broader community than we've had in the past. So one of the ways we're going to do that is through uh, partnerships. So we have land. Uh, this land was given to us, and we can say, you know what, this is our land, we can just keep it. And if Craig Benter wants to start an institute, he can go run around the city and figure out where he can afford land. And I guarantee you, if that was the case, Craig Venter would not be here. Uh, Craig Venter, by the way, is an alum. Uh, Craig Venter would go to uh, Research Triangle Park or some other place where somebody would give him land for free to create an institute. So we have made a conscious decision to say there are certain things that are of strategic importance and through strategic intent we're going to put these places, research institutes, on our land because they have a very big impact on our research. They allow us to collaborate with uh, their faculty, our faculty, increase our PhD student size. So Craig Venter is just one example. Sanford Consortium is the other example. The third example we are thinking about is the Ludwig Institute, which hopefully would be uh, near Craig Venter. Now we don't have land to kind of do this for everybody, right? But point I'm trying to make is, as an organization, we have said it is of interest not only to us as an organization, but to this county, to this state, to this community, that some of these key high-tech companies, high-tech research uh, enterprises literally be co-located with us, and we are going out of our way to make sure that that's the case. Now, uh, philanthropy, which uh, I've already talked about, where this community has been very supportive. But I think what we have not done is we have not done and tapped into our alumni base, and we need to do that. Now, because of the support of this community, we're going to be building a hospital. And I don't know how many of you have seen the plans for this new Jacobs Hospital. It's going to be six floors, three different hospitals, two floors each. And I think, and I have had the opportunity to see the plans for this hospital, actually virtual simulations in literally this place, uh, Cal IT2. This is going to change the nature of medical care. This is going to make a hospital very different from what we think of as a hospital. When you walk into a hospital like Jacobs, uh, you would actually never want to leave. I don't I mean this in a good way. You would have gourmet food. You would have top chefs serving food. Uh, but this would be a place where your health, uh, your care for yourself would be of prime concern, but also uh, the surroundings uh, would be of great concern. Uh, the cardiovascular center, the Prevost Music Center I talked about. So there's a lot of good stuff going on out here, so I don't want to uh, bore you too much with that. Let me just... We talked about a billion dollars of research, sustainability initiatives, and how we are very strong supporters of that. In all of this, what is not what has not changed, what will not change, is our commitment to excellence, and I can guarantee you of that. Uh, let me give you an example of uh, one example of uh, innovation, and then I think I'll probably stop and then go to Q and A. So this is. Uh, institutional innovation. So this thing is called CalIT squared, CalIT2. This is the building you're sitting in. It is California Institute for Information and Communication Technologies. And Ramesh sitting here is the director of that. It is a multi-campus organization, but we are the dominant dog, if I may say so. We are the one that leads this intellectually. And uh, this place is literally a living laboratory. So if you walk through this building, this is the Cal IT2 building. So if you walk through this building, you will see experiments out here. Experiments not just in the context of research and where the future is going to be in terms of information technologies, but experiments with organizations. How are people going to be working together? How are we going to put teams of uh, people from multiple disciplines, multiple divisions, all in one place, bring them together for a period of three years, solve a problem, 
disperse them, bring a different team together, right? And this is what, and this is where it's all happening. Uh, this is where the departments look for, look towards uh, making sure the capability of their faculty is being leveraged. And this is where I, as chancellor, uh, look up to to make sure that. Uh, it is my lens to the outside world to know what is going on out there. Uh, so when I am out there talking or when I'm inside here ta thinking about how do we position UC San Diego, this is one of the places. And this is not the only place. This is one of the 22 ORUs, Organized Research Units. But I picked this as an example because we are using their auditorium. And you won't have a chance this evening, but this is a state-of-the-art auditorium. Uh, if you have a chance, you should look at the projection capabilities and the three 3D capabilities that exist out here. And it's like too bad my talk is not high tech enough to show you that, right? Uh, but somewhere along the line, you'll get a chance to do that. Uh, we are in the business of nurturing large scale projects, right? Uh, Cal IT Square or Cal IT2. And there are many, many examples of that. One is this Ocean Observatories Initiative, which is uh, led by Cal IT2, but uh, 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 Scripps Oceanographic is a very important part of it. Many such examples, uh, examples of converting, uh, taking algae and converting it to biofuels. Uh, it is a great example of not only research that is done out here, but of a company that exists down the street uh, employing a couple of hundred people called Sapphire Energy, and it is founded by faculty from here. And I had the opportunity to go there, and literally they can take algae, algae, and the fuel that comes out, the crude, smells like normal crude. It's like it came out of uh, Louisiana Bay or something. I could not tell the difference, right? But that's the type of technology that's going to change the world. That's the type of technology that's going to change human being, uh, change our life out here. Uh, there's another great example of a center that is being built within Cal IT2, and this is policy design and evaluation lab. So there's too many words out here, but let me explain to you what the concept is. If you look at current technologies, take energy, take environment, uh, take uh, wireless, biotech, what you find is public policy is very deeply intertwined with technology, as in you could have great technology that goes nowhere because the policy was bad. You could have bad policy that leads to killing of a technology. So this notion, this PDEL, PDAL, uh, Policy Design and Evaluation Labs, is aimed at understanding how do these two connect and how do we make sure that the right policy is built for the right technology so that it be benefits mankind. Uh, so this is a collaboration between our Center for International Relations and Public Policy, Engineering, Medical School, uh, School of Physical Sciences, uh, and you can go down the list. So this is pretty uh, multidisciplinary, very broad, right? So as entrepreneurs, you might think, why do I care about this? If you have a company that's doing gene sequencing, if you have a company that's creating fuel from algae, uh, where you need to have land use policies, because this algae companies need very large tracts of land to grow algae. If you have a company that's trying to understand what part of the wireless spectrum I should be focusing on to build this chip, for some sort of communication, like 911 communications, for example. Policy plays a very big role. And I think this is the place you would come to to ask yourself, you know, how can I get help out here? So that's a PDL team. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm, I think I'm going to skip this because I've talked longer then. So let me just tell you where we are. Billion dollars in research, 6,000 plus awards. 300 patents uh, that were filed just literally in the past year, 88 of them were issued, uh, 46 inventions were licensed, 13 startup companies were created, uh, 10 of them were in San Diego. We don't insist they be in San Diego, but we strongly prefer, we love it when they're in San Diego, uh, right? And if you just look at the UC system, you will see that in terms of startups, we are basically number two, literally after UCLA, which had 19 startups. And in terms of US patents, active patents, we are number one. So the point I'm trying to make is, when you're Californian, you think of UC Berkeley, UCLA, and then UC San Diego. But when you're San Diego and you're Californian, you should think about UC San Diego, UC Berkeley, UCLA, UC Davis, and that's how the list should go on, right? So thank you very much. I'm going to stop here, and I hope we still have a few minutes for questions and answers. Thanks a lot. So.
that's where we stop. Okay. Thanks, Pradeep. Uh, let me maybe uh, start with uh, some questions, uh, maybe, and then from audience, uh, you can, uh, uh, you know, one of the things, the, one of the phenomena that I've seen in this country is, if you look at it, you know, previously, a lot of fundamental research was done in <coughs> industry, right. like IBM research, AT&T Bell Labs, and also university. Now, uh, a lot of companies have stopped doing, I mean, they're not funding as much fundamental research, mm -hmm. and that has moved to university, and even university has some challenges. I think you alluded to that. Uh, you know, the DARPA funding has reduced, uh, you know, state funding has reduced, the core funding that used to be around. What do you, what do you see happening going, uh, going to the future? Right. Actually, so that's a pretty good question. So I think I cannot predict what's going to happen, but let me just take you back uh, to World War II. If you look at World War II, one of the good outcomes of World War II, especially for this country, was the creation of the Great American Research University. And that's when MIT, Stanford, Carnegie Mellon, all of these became research universities because they had contributed to the Manhattan Project. Then if you follow the history after that, there was significant investment in what we call civilian research because uh, the president at that time wanted to take all the uh, war-based research and convert that into civilian-based research to benefit mankind. So the impact of that has been an economy that has been on a growth curve that no other economy in this world has ever seen. So literally from 1945 to now, our standard of living has gone up like four times. Don't count the last four years, uh, right? It has amazingly gone up uh, by a very big amount. Uh, and a lot of this was because of the research we did. We built new companies. We created new industries, for God's sake. Not just built companies. We created industries. Semiconductor industry would be non-existent were it not for the U.S. Internet would be non-existent were it not for the U.S. Software industry would be non-existent were it not for the U.S. So the universities have played a big role, but so did the companies. But as the companies started focusing, I think the university's role became more important in research. And it became significantly more important in a community as an engine of economic development. So I do, I am concerned that research funding is going to go down, especially with sequestration. So I'm not telling you how you should vote on the other election, uh, but God forbid there's sequestration. It's going to be bad news. But I have the following faith in this country. I think every so often we take a wrong turn, but before we fall off the cliff, we come back and we go on the right path. So I am still very bullish. I'm still very confident. We might see a reduction in research in the transient uh, next couple of years, but I think over time we would be a winner. I think this country has an amazing higher education system, amazing culture, and I cannot see us losing that very easily in the next 50 years. Thanks, Pradeep. <clears throat> another, uh, I think, uh, talking about the companies created and all that, another question that comes to my mind is I look at uh, the model of uh, Stanford. And Stanford, if you look at uh, uh, several big companies have been created in the corridor uh, you know, by students of Stanford. I, I think what I see is there is that creativity here, but how can we, you know, I think the model for creation for Stanford, what I've seen is very different than, in general, I'm talking about UC, not right. UC San Diego, which is, you know, they, what they do is they, when you want to license something, a technology from Stanford, they will license the technology, they will even fund you. Any, any round of VC funding, they will put 10% of their money into right. that company. Uh, do you see that happening, or do you see that VC-style funding happening within UCSD or UC system? Actually, there were many questions in that single question, so well, let's just talk about. Uh, <laughs> so, so let's talk about tech transfer. Uh, do we have a problem with tech transfer? Yes. So I'm not going to fight you. I'm not going to argue. I think we have a problem. I think we have a problem just like everybody else does, but that's not an excuse. I think we need to fix it. And the strategic planning process that we go through over the next uh, 9 to 12 months, that would be one of the issues. And I'd like to love to hear from you, the community, and many of you I know are chancellors, associates, many of you are supporters of this uh, great place. So I want to hear from you. 
and uh, we will work on fixing it. So we have already taken some actions in the interim. Uh, so if you look at our patents and our licensing strategy in the health sciences, we have a more streamlined strategy with forms that are already online. Uh, but we want to expand that to just about everything we do. So that was question number one. Question number two embedded in your single question was the creation of companies like Google and others, right? Okay. So we may not be Stanford, uh, Hewlett and Packard did not come out of here yet. But let me tell you, in the last uh, literally four weeks, Symer was acquired. That was created by UC San Diego uh, alumni and faculty. Uh, just a couple of weeks, uh, what is it, Perigin sis Perigene system? Perigene systems. Went public, created by alumni out here. I think we are just seeing the beginning of who we are and what we want to be and what we are going to be, right? So I'm very bullish about it, and I'm, as chancellor, would be supporting it fully. And let me tell you, even if I was not supporting it, the DNA out here is such that my support uh, would be irrelevant. I think it just make it faster and better. But in the end, I think UC San Diego will do the right place, and I, as chancellor, would certainly be supporting that. Was there a third question in there? or <laughs> I don't know. I lost no. track. There's a... And uh, with the election, everyone's talking about jobs. And in my own experience, this is the third startup company that I'm in, and each company tends to get smaller and smaller. Can you talk about jobs and where the next generation of jobs are going to come from? You know, if I knew the answer, I'd be running for president <laughs> <laughs> with a good shot at winning. Uh, so I think the way I would think about this is literally looking at uh, how jobs have been created, right? So let me ask a question. So if you look at the following industries, so look at chip manufacturing industry, the shoe industry, the car industry, and textile industry. What do you think these have in common? Anybody want to guess? Well, fine. So they kind of do have that in common. But I think the point I was trying to make is we created every one of them. We owned every one of them at different points in our history. And we, on purpose, let every one of them get a, go away. It was not stupidity. It was not an accident. We basically said we only have so many hundred million people that are going to be employed. Uh, we don't have enough uh, as an economist. Uh, we need to deploy the manpower on this higher end uh, manufacturing now than the low end manufacturing. When it was commoditized, it just went away. So I think we have to invent that future, right? And our problem has been that since we gave up the past future, the past uh, enterprise to where we are right now. We have not invented that future seamlessly. And I think the whole enterprise of uh, green tech was aimed at that, but the evolution cycles, the development cycles were long enough that we could not create enough jobs. Uh, I think the next generation of manufacturing is going to be what I think of as biomanufacturing. Uh, it's not just pharmaceuticals. It's like biotechnology, organs, uh, human tissue, uh, all of this done artificially. Again, the development cycle is such that we are not ready for that, and we gave up what we were, uh, what we were controlling before. So I think we are just in this little valley right now. Uh, we're going to last in this valley, in my mind, at least for a couple of years. Uh, but I think things will look better. So I don't know which one I would pick. Nanotechnology would be the other. Uh, but again, nanotechnology has not lived up to its potential. Uh, people thought it was going to solve a lot of problems. So it is the enabler of solving many problems, by, but by itself, it's not an industry, right? So uh, I would just try to be patient. You know, make sure your money's invested in bonds and not in... <laughs> <laughs> Not in U.S. Treasuries, because at half a percent interest rate, you're going to go nowhere. Um, I think investing in China would be a good thing, but not too much, because it's more risky than you think. I would not invest in Japan. I'm not an economist. I just play one on TV. So, <laughs> Okay, so let's see. Please. Yes, uh, yeah, Sorry. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. There was a study done at Princeton University talking about uh, legacy students, and that study's 
said that legacy students defined as students whose parents were well-to-do and rich, their SAT scores were elevated by 126 points. And my question to you is, would this be true for UCSD? So, so there's, okay, so let me answer first a simple question. It is not true for UCSD. Uh, because it's not true for UC, actually. Our whole admission policy is based on admitting the top 12.5% of all graduating high school students in this state, right? They may be legacy, they may not be legacy, but if you're legacy, it carries no extra points. Uh, but let me tell you a philosophical view. I think education in this country has been used as an important tool for upward mobility and also for expanding the wealth and bringing more people into the middle, the upper middle class and the wealthy class in this country. I think if we focus too much on legacy uh, admissions, which most of these Ivy League schools have anywhere from 25 to 35, 40% legacy admissions, I think we are overlooking the fact that the way this society, this country becomes a great country is by giving everybody who's got uh, the talent and uh, the capability the opportunity to succeed. And talent and capability in my mind are distributed evenly regardless of uh, ethnicity, color, religion, race, whatever. So I personally am not a great fan of legacy admissions. I think they go away from what made this country great. And if we kind of get into the legacy admissions, we would get into some of the European countries or the country that uh, many of us out here come from, which is based on legacy of the rich propagating rich kids, propagating rich kids, and so on and so forth. And very few other people get a chance to be in the middle class and the upper middle class. And I think that's what distinguishes this country. And I hope legacy admissions are discouraged to the extent possible. My view, so. You mentioned about the upheaval in, in higher education, but I think there's an upheaval in, in education, and that's coming from the access to online education. I mean, there was a really interesting article in The New Yorker recently by uh, Chris, uh, Clay Christensen, who said, you know, my wife just went, I mean, I was, I was skeptical. My wife just had a nurse practitioner's degree from Duke living in San Diego. And uh, I became a convert because I saw the community of education that is created in online. Right. And Clay Christensen said in his article, he, he actually did a, did a class for the University of Phoenix. And when he looked at himself in the class after, the, you know, with the, with the multimedia capabilities, he said, that's the best class I've ever given. So he said, not only online education is as good, it can be as good as the regular education, but it can be better. So what are your thoughts on where, I mean, and, and what I see is an incredible opportunity to change the world. Mm -hmm. Because a kid in Ghana, Today, all they need is to have internet access and they can have an access to an education that they never had before. So talking about mobility like you were before, I mean, we have a huge opportunity to change the world and to make the world to the image of the United States because they, the, the academic institutions in the United States are so powerful and influential. Right. So how do you see this evolving, at least from your perspective at UCSD? Right, so I think when we talk about online education, uh, we need to first be a little bit more accurate. So there is the process of education which involves content delivery and learning. So online education basically is online content delivery. There is no guarantee of learning at the other end unless you're motivated. Secondly, uh, there is more hype to this than reality, but doesn't mean there's no reality. So let me talk about the hype. When you think about the 18-year-olds, so you got to segment the population into different age groups. So think about 12 through 16, 18 to 22 years old versus more professional education beyond an undergrad degree. That 18 to 22-year-old, that development, that age has got significant component of emotional and intellectual development. Right? It is not just learning by rote some few facts of mathematics or physics or chemistry and saying I'm a BS in chemistry. Right? So this education system that we offer, what we call the residential education system, is actually a very constructive, very formative education system 
where content delivery is a very small part of it. Much of the expense in this system comes from the residential life, uh, comes from uh, the opportunities we create. And I think most of the population has lost sight of the fact because they're caught in this hype of online education. Now, with that said, I think there is great virtue in what I call technology-enhanced learning, which is very different than online content delivery. Using technology, my 18-year-old understands how to play video games a lot better than I do. He understands how to hack into an Android operating system, and I'm a computer scientist, for God's sake, and I still don't understand how to hack into an operating system, and plus my ethics are slightly different. But that's a, <laughs> but that, that's a different story, right? But this kid, and I think we need to understand what are these kids, where do they come from, and how do we use technology to make their learning better, faster, uh, and more efficient. And if you do that right, so if we kind of do it right, and if we improve the four-year graduation rates, the six-year graduation rates, uh, you will see that we would automatically reduce the cost, right? So I am not going to blindly endorse online education as the panacea that's going to cure everything. The cost will come down to zero because I guarantee you it will not come down to zero, right? Uh, nobody's talking about maintaining the infrastructure that goes in the back end, which is a very expensive infrastructure. Nobody's talking about the cognitive processes that are involved in learning. And just videotaping my lecture, like tomorrow, I think this is being videotaped. Tomorrow when you watch this videotape, I hope you don't, but just in case you get bored and you do, this would not be the same interaction as it is right now in person. Right? It's not clear to me that the learning and the engagement and the absorption would be the same. Right? So I don't know if I've answered your question. I think we have to segregate that in the context of learning and delivery. We have to segregate that in the context of various age groups. And I think the 18 to 22 year old age group, the undergraduate, is a sensitive period of everybody's life where development happens because of social interactions. And putting that person in a room, uh, trying to listen to video lectures, not clear to me, will result in a better society. Well, I, I didn't, I mean, I come from a place I didn't go to college. I don't have a college education. I went straight from high school to medical school. I live with my parents, so I never had that residential experience. Right. So, uh, for me, it was not essential to mature, assuming that I'm a mature person, of course. But uh, <laughs> That's good. So, so, two things, right? Assuming you're a mature person, which I assume you are. I hope you are. I hope your assumption is right. But you could be the exception, right? So... I cannot imagine that 90% of the population is like you. In fact, I know it's not like you, right? We all need social interaction of different types to learn. So there will be some people like you, but they are a minority. They are not the majority, and we have to focus on the majority. I think if everybody in society was not educated uh, or didn't go to college, I don't think they would all have a chance to go to medical school after that. So it's like saying that, you know, so I have to make a sarcastic comment here. So there is this great thing going on with uh, Peter Thiel, who's giving uh, students like $100,000 to check out of school. Fine. I can imagine 20 people out of uh, 20 million students graduating from high school uh, fall in that category. But to then assume that everybody falls in that category and college is a waste of money, which is the argument he's making by induction and by extension, I think is actually dumb. It's not only dumb, you're doing a disservice to society and to humanity, so. I agree. Well, um, we all know that UCSD is probably the most important economic engine in this region, and you talked a little bit about that, and you said, well, we had 13 startups last year, which makes us number two in the UC system, and I would take the point of view that 13 is a terrible number, and, so I'm curious on your thoughts on sort of going forward in the next 10 to 20 years, what can this campus do to be a great economic engine for the region? Right. So I don't know if 13 is a terrible number, but I'll just assume you're right. But let me tell you uh, what we are doing. 
So if you look at entrepreneurship right now, it's embedded in uh, various divisions. So Rajesh Gupta out here, uh, who is the chair of computer science and engineering, is literally raising funds, and he's already raised money to create uh, an entrepreneurship center. We have an entrepreneurship center in engineering. We have one in Rady School of Business. We have one in uh, uh, health sciences, right? So as chancellor, I worry about having too many of these. Uh, but then, as chancellor, I say you can never have too many of a good thing, right? So let mul multiple flowers bloom. So we, so I'm encouraging all of this, and it's happening all across the board. And I think what you will see is that the number of startup companies would be rate limited by the intent and the talent of students we have. It would not be rate limited because the chancellor said the answer is 20 and nobody can go more than 20. Right? And I don't know what that number is going to be. I hope it's 50. I hope it's 100. So let me, uh, Pradeep, let me follow up with that question. Uh, Stanford has a panel of VCs, and maybe you might have seen something like that at Carnegie Mellon, right? You have a panel of, so the VC culture is already embedded into the institution. Are you thinking sim along similar lines, or uh, what is your thought there? So I think it would be. Great to have that here, too. Uh, so when I was in Pittsburgh and I was looking at San Diego, to me it was like the same as Palo Alto because, after all, they're literally 2,450 miles apart from Pittsburgh, right? Maybe 10 miles plus and minus. But when I got here, I realized uh, that this place has a paucity of uh, venture capitalists. It has more than Pittsburgh did, but still nothing compared to uh, Silicon Valley. Right, so I think we need to be able to attract more venture capital uh, capital out here, and I think that will happen one of two ways. One is when other VCs realize that we are one of the top places in biotech and communications, they'll come and uh, invest here. And the other is when companies like Symer and others go public and go acquired, and there's a lot of wealth generated. People who are li who've been living here, who made their wealth out here, will decide to invest out here, just like Irwin Jacobs has, and that over time will create more venture capital. And I can tell you, UC San Diego would be at the forefront if and when I see the opportunity to literally create a small group. And if there is some VCs out here who have an interest, love to have a small group out here that would invest foc investments focused on UC San Diego companies. Uh, in a way that the tech transfer is totally uh, seamless, in a way that the tech transfer is totally enabled without violating any of the state or uh, transparency laws that we have to uh, adhere to. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so I flew down from the barrier just to listen to you. I'm sorry? I flew down from San Francisco just to come listen to you. Uh, to hear what you have to say about innovation in the academic environment. Thank you. Um, and I have the fortunate or unfortunate experience of having been through the innovation cycle at UC Berkeley and Stanford so far to see what's happening up there. Uh, I'm interested to know your perspective on, as Peter Thiel talks about, he's teaching now at Stanford to the students who actually shouldn't be leaving the program because he feels that they should leave but he's actually teaching them about the real life of entrepreneurship. And as you start to look at interconnecting the different pieces of the ecosystem to facilitate innovation and entrepreneurship here in the San Diego corridor, what is it that you see is necessary to um, take UC San Diego to the, to the national prominence in terms of its position in birthing more and more startups and more and more companies that that put it at the forefront of biotech and, and high tech? Do you feel that it's having a board of directors of VCs? Do you feel that it's having uh, a, a, some, a, a board of innovation folks from, from companies here like Qualcomm who come in and advise the students? What do you feel is necessary? So it's many things. So I think the number one thing that is necessary is literally our faculty doing world-class cutting edge research that is aimed at solving societal problems or problems of value to society. In the context of doing that, I think they have to involve both PhD students and undergraduate students because that's the manpower, that's the future. These are the people who at age 22, 25, 26 say, you know what, I'm alone, 
I don't need to get married right now. I can take four years off and I'm just going to go take a chance and live in the back of my car. And literally, I have this dream and I'm going to pursue this, right? So that's one thing. Secondly, we need to have a culture out here, uh, which we nearly do, a can-do culture, a culture that is not limited by uh, the bureaucracy of the UC system that is not limited by the bureaucracy of uh, the administration uh, within UC San Diego, which basically says, look, I can do it and I will do it and I have the ability to do it, right? Then I guarantee you we have the faculty out here who literally share that culture, who come from various places and who literally have that culture. Third thing I think we need is literally... Uh, reducing friction. And by friction, I mean there is an energy barrier between wanting to do something and having the opportunity to do something. And that energy barrier, you need to grease those skids and reduce that uh, barrier down to zero. And that would be, I would think, high-risk seed funding from angels because I don't think VCs are capable, even though they say they are, of high-risk basic seed funding, right? By seed funding, I'm talking about 200K, you know, 150K. And I see some of that out here. I don't see a lot of that out here. But I would like to see that we as a university, as a campus, have like $10 million of seed funding available where we can call on the people for like, make capital calls, where these projects are chosen by uh, seasoned entrepreneurs, uh, people in, uh, who've done companies multiple times in their life, a couple of faculty members who understand, uh, who can evaluate if this technology is, literally there's something behind it or it's all like BS, right? And then following that with more like VC money, uh, at a later stage. But I think even if we did not have enough VC money, if we had the first three things satisfied with seed funding, uh, I know that VCs typically don't like to go beyond their 20 mile radius, but that was the dot com boom days when there were a lot of opportunities floating around uh, within sand, around the 20 miles of Sand Hill Road. Now, the same VCs, I'm talking Kleiner Perkins and others, who would go fly like 2,000 miles to find the right company, right? And I think the future you will see is going to be more in what I think are physical sciences or physical companies, uh, sorry, physical sciences and engineering, like uh, alternative fuel technology, green technology, biotechnology, nanotechnology. And information technology is going to play a very enabling role. But I don't see uh, the Apples and the Googles and the Microsofts being created at the same pace, the Junipers, the Cisco's, as they were in 1996, 7, 8, 9, 2000, right? So, and I think we are positioned because we are a great computer science place, but we are a greater, apologize for saying that, place known for biomedical engineering, health sciences, biomedical sciences, biological sciences, physical sciences, chemistry, oceanography, right? So we have the right ingredients in place. We just need to enable it now. Maybe, pretty in the meantime, let me ask you one question. Uh, there are entrepreneurs in this audience, and you know these entrepreneurs are have been there, done that. I think how can you enable this partnership between university and entrepreneurs in the community to get uh, this engine accelerated? So this is where I'm going to punt the question and say, you tell me what it takes to enable you. No, I'm, I'm being very serious because I can sit here as an academic and say, you know what, I, tech transfer is easy, uh, you got the license, so what's your problem? Maybe tech transfer is not the only answer. Maybe your answer is, hey Pradeep, I need access to a couple of courses. I don't want to go to UC San Diego, but I want to take a 20-hour course in entrepreneurship that will just uh, open my uh, thinking up. I want to be networked to other people, which is what a place like Thai would do, right? So this is where I want to hear from you seriously. And when I say I want to hear from you, I want to hear from you, right? I don't promise that everything I hear would be acted on, but I can guarantee you everything I 
you tell me will be heard, will be thought about, and then would be acted on in the context of UC San Diego and the community. I promise you that. And you can make Ramesh the point of contact here. <laughs> he can send him email. No, see, I, I mean this seriously. And both Ramesh and Rajesh. Okay, Nikhil, you had a question? Oh. Sorry, but I was waiting for the last one. Yeah, Nikhil, you can ask. Now, as a <laughs> venture capitalist that does live in San Diego, I'd be happy to put money in if uh, something exists. We are capable but not willing most often from the seed money. But my question, uh, you know, and certainly we can share a lot of things. My question is more, and you talked about a little bit the technology transformation. People keep comparing to Stanford. Stanford has the benefit of being in a unique location, and they very early on decided that they would allow technology transfer with various commercial things. Most public universities, that's not as easy. And, you know, money flows to the path of least resistance, and any such resistance holds it up. What can be done to sort of make that easier? to allow funding to come into companies that are coming out of UCSD. Uh, I'm sorry, I missed that. So what can be done to make technology transfer easier? Yeah, or? I mean, the process of getting it in the UC system is much harder than it because is in Stanford. Coming out of UCSD, what can VCs do to make, put money into that? Some so, ideas. So I don't quite, uh, so maybe I'm missing the point here. So I don't quite know why it is hard for you to put money when the company is coming out of UCSD. But uh, I tell you what, if there's a specific example, I'd be happy to listen more because that should not be hard. Uh, taking a technology out of here should be basically a zero resistance process. Where I can see resistance is in the licensing part where the tech transfer office thinks that, oh, this is the one that's going to be Microsoft. So I cannot just get 1% of a $100 billion company. I need 20% of a $100 billion company because that's going to save me, right? And that greed basically kills us. Uh, so let me give you one statistic and then I'll let you uh, do a follow-up. If you look at the the income generated from tech transfer in the universities in this country, so look at all the 300 plus universities, the net return on $100 million of federal investment through tech transfer is 1.5%. Right now it's doing better than the U.S. Treasury, but if you look back <laughs> over a 20 year period, it's pathetic, it's really bad. So our whole notion of tech transfer being a money maker has been distorted by places like Columbia, uh, where there are two patents that bring in like 200 plus million dollars, uh, places like Wisconsin, uh, and all in the biotech area, right? So that's one way to think about this. And I think that pretty much is a bad model. In my mind, the model of licensing should be very seamless, uh, effortless uh, because the probability of making money through licensing is close to zero. Then there is a tech transfer model that uh, Stanford pioneered, which is do great stuff, empower people, let them go out, build companies, you know, enable the creation of companies, and don't even ask. And this is in the early days of HP, right? And they'll come back and give you. More lately, if you look at Google, for example, the tech transfer of Google was not quite that easy, even though now that Google is a hundred plus billion or maybe two hundred billion dollar company, uh, and Stanford's made a lot of money, and so did many individuals. People say, "Oh, yeah, it was easy," but the process of getting Google out of Stanford was not quite a one percent go in peace type of process. I mean, that's exactly the issue. I mean, the one percent, twenty percent is the debate, but. I think Stanford has got it more templatized, if you will, yes. if you allow no it in most other places. No doubt. And that's what makes it easier. Uh, I know Michigan and has some of that. Uh, I don't know enough about other places. But I do know UC has been a harder struggle. I understand that. I acknowledge that. And I think it's going to take me a little while to understand what are the fundamental impediments. Part of it could be just bureaucracy where nobody wants to ask the hard questions and oh because we did it x last year we're going to do x this year and nobody's going to ask the question uh, but i come from a private place i bring a type of thinking that uh, this place probably hasn't seen at the chancellor level before so we'll see but it would be my goal to really make it 
a very low energy barrier. So I have a question, uh, very intrigued by your earlier comments around the connection between technology and policy development. And so given that our political system is in uh, sort of a persistent gridlock and not really doing well with policy, and given that technology um, is moving ahead of policy uh, with an ever widening gap, um, what what is your vision? And, and and given that someone like Mark Zuckerberg can step into that vacuum and actually drive public policy from a commercial perspective, what's your vision of of how you can uh, begin closing the gap between the advances in technology and the vacuum of policy at at, at the legislative and and executive levels of government? If I were to be facetious, I'd say get rid of Tea Party, because if you look at <laughs> If you look at the history, you know, the Republicans and the Democrats have had their differences, but they worked really well, uh, even when there were zealots, right? But lately what we have seen is this extreme, uh, how, should, how should I, what word would I use, Zeal zealotry, where there is no notion of a conversation. It's like my way or the highway type of position. And if two parties take that position, there is no conversation. So I think what we're going to see is the sequestration, uh, which is going to reach, uh, which is going to be a very bad situation. And somewhere along the line, these politicians would shape up and really start to have a conversation. Now, I have friends on both sides of the aisle, and they tell me that, hey, we used to talk. I mean, a lot of this drama about D versus R was mainly for the TVs, but then we'd go out, have a drink, and talk. But now that it's more like a two-and-a-half or a three-party system, there is no conversation. There's not enough votes for these two to talk uh, to make progress. So I don't know what to tell you. So question was really about how industry is sort of filling the void. Do you see a role for academia to fill part of that void, given that that gridlock doesn't seem to have yeah, so, half-life? So the problem is the following. So academia has a role, but you see our role is not in taking position A or position B. Our role is in creating all the knowledge, all the information, and the analysis that it takes to decide A versus B, right? So we have to be what I think of as a neutral arbiters of this situation. Uh, if there are technology companies that are taking a position, they're basically using uh, in this bad environment, not their ability to create knowledge and be neutral, but their ability to influence a certain side using political contributions, right? So I think we are playing two very different roles, and I would like to focus more on the role of creating all the right knowledge, the right information, and being a neutral party that both parties or three parties or four parties can go to and look for answers. Right, because we don't have the ability, and even if we did, we should never use the ability uh, to use our economic means to influence policy for a few people. That's the role of the university. We should be the creators of overall good. So we are what I think of as the common good. Uh, has a I, uh, sorry, hi, thank you. Uh, so when I was looking to go to graduate school several years ago, I interviewed all over the country, Yale, Stanford, Harvard, and when I came to San Diego and interviewed here, I was blown away. I thought it was the most amazing place to do science. I was just wanted to be here, so came, did my doctorate, have now worked for several years with the biotech industry, um, but what I've really seen has been missing for San Diego, and what, what I'm happy that I think you're doing here, is I think you're really communicating the impact that you see San Diego is making. But what I don't see, and what I'd really like to challenge you to do, and, and my question for you is, what are you going to do f moving mm -hmm. forward? But to make UC San Diego on the global and national level what you're doing here, and really communicate the value, because that's going to help you build the culture that's going to help you right. draw VCs. That's, it's what you're telling us is we're a leading institution, but I'm not sure many people know that unless you're directly connected to seeing this. So my question is, moving forward, how will you communicate the value and, and attract people and fire them up about what's going on right. here? So I think uh, you make a really good point, and part of this planning process is exactly doing that. Uh, you know, I, 
was joking with people. I said, you know, we sit in this beautiful San Diego weather and beautiful state of California, but with a very Midwestern view of life, which is like, keep on working hard and you'll be rewarded. Don't worry about it. Life would be good, right? So I was, right? So 30 years in Pittsburgh, so I understand that mentality. And I think that mentality has served us well in building a critical mass in, of accomplishments that we can talk about now. But going forward, I think we need to beat our chest a little bit more. We need to take more credit, of who we, credit for who we are. And we need to have our leadership involved in leading forums in the country. And I don't see that. Like I look at my vice chancellors, for example, and none of them are involved in the leading societies of their area in the country. And that is going to change. Um, my department chairs, my deans, my institute directors, they're all going to be involved in some leading fora, which is more than just their own society, own their own technical society. It'd be like thought forums, uh, thought leadership uh, meetings. And I think it's going to take a little bit of a while. And most importantly, I want our alumni, 140,000 of them who are out there, to go and talk about how good we are, right? Even though we were not as good 30 years ago when they graduated, today we are damn good, if I may use that word. And we need to talk about it. I need our community out here to talk about it, right? So it's going to be what it take, what one would say it takes a village uh, to make us known. And I hope you're all going to be contributing and help me, helping me in this. Historically, great universities have had sort of a balance between social sciences and sciences, including engineering. Right. With the pressure to get more and more funds from the non-public side, right. and a lot of that appears to be associated with science and engineering, is this going to affect the character or the mix of what has been going on in universities? <clears throat> so I think uh, the answer is it could, but I can tell you that as long as I'm chancellor, my goal would be it will not. And the reason it will not is not because I'm against bringing more money for science and engineering. The reason it will not is because I want us to be a student-centered, student-focused university that is solving problems of societal interest. And if you look at what are these problems of societal interest, food and fuel for the 21st century, social justice, information technology and its impact on healthcare, uh, you know, what are like implants for biomedical engineering. I can go down the list. You will see that most of these problems, environment, energy, are left and right brain oriented. So if I want to train the best possible citizen that's going to go out there and be a leader and impact humanity in extremely positive ways, I have no choice but to train an individual, man, woman, young man, young woman, who's going to be left and right brain oriented. And if I have to do that, I have no choice but to have strength on both sides of this aisle, right? Which means arts, humanities, social sciences, science, engineering, physical sciences, they all have to be strong and coexist in a harmonious, holistic way, right? So it's not that I'm against money, don't get me wrong, but just where I think we should be focused leads me to conclude that we got to be a balanced university. Now, this does not mean that we would do everything in literature or everything in social sciences, but it does mean that we will have enough of each one of these so that the young man or woman that we are educating is going to go out and be trained and educated to be a leader and solve problems. environment. You kind of touched on it earlier with the uh, grad student going to buy diapers and the social aspects of the school. Can you perhaps lay out your vision for what you would like to see uh, constructed on campus? Yes. Yeah, so I have to tell you, I don't have a clear vision of what it should be, but I can tell you what is influencing me right now. I think if I were to state a vision today, it would be to build what I think of as a living and a learning community. And when I think about a living and a learning community, it is a community where people live like normal people, like you and I in our uh, societies or neighborhoods. But at the same time, it's an educational institution and it's a learning community. 
So why do I think that's important? So as I've gone around and talked to people, uh, I've been told, uh, and I kind of buy that, I nearly buy that, that the diversity on this campus is not as good as it can be or should be is because we are a very isolated campus. And I can tell you I see that. Like if I, like we are standing here, we are five minutes from my office. Um, there is nothing out here where I could go and hang out, have a drink, uh, I could take friends out to dinner, uh, I would see people running around uh, like in a mall or something, right? Uh, the closest place to here is uh, this place on La Jolla Village Drive, I think which is about a mile and a half away or a mile away, which is not quite walking distance and the bus service is not that good. We have a lot of land, about, I don't know, 1,500 acres in this area, uh, and not all of it is occupied. We have three playhouses, one of the tops in the country in one location, three music theaters right here in a different location where people come and they complain about finding parking, where our PhD students don't have enough housing, and when they do have housing, they don't have enough parking. So there are all of these issues that clearly point to one problem, which is our land use policy, our visioning of this infrastructure, this acreage, we have to really take a fresh look at it. I don't know when was the last time we took a fresh look at it. Um, I'm willing to go back and see when it was, but I guarantee you it was not in the last 10 years. Uh, and I think we need to make this a community so that people in the local neighborhood come to the play, go to the Wolfgang Puck restaurant, which is open only when the plays are playing, and that too it doesn't make enough money and it's about to go out of business, right? Uh, and there is no good restaurant out here in a two-mile radius. So I'm just kind of making this up kind of randomly as I'm watching the situation, but I think there's an opportunity out here. And I want to spend the next, uh, I don't know, six to nine months part of the strategic planning process to run a parallel visioning process for what is it that we own, who is it that we want to be from an infrastructure, from a land use point of view, right? And how that feeds into our academic and other mission and vision. So just building on your last point, um, I had the fortune of uh, meeting Tony Shu from Zappos recently. From who? From Zappos. Zappos, Zappos okay. Yeah, uh, the company that uh, sells shoes online mm -hmm. that was recently acquired by Amazon. And he's building an entire living, learning community, an entire village, so to speak, in downtown Las Vegas. And his goal is to increase the number of collisions between people because he feels that it, when he was in university, he had a high number of collisions with mm -hmm. various diverse people, and that's what brings about new ideas and innovation. So it sounds like you're looking to do something similar. It sounds like it, except he has a lot more money than I do. <laughs> so it seems to me that I could make his dream come true out here <laughs> in a location with more beautiful weather and a lot better people, I think. So if you want to make the connection, I'd love to meet this guy. <laughs> so you have uh, mentioned energy uh, probably five or six times in your talk. Do you see UCSD contributing to uh, research, fundamental research or translational research in the field of energy? Absolutely. So, I, where? So I gave you an example of uh, biofuels from algae, I think is a great example. Uh, a crude oil from algae is one of the examples. Solar energy would be the other. Uh, I think, so here is a problem I see. So if you look at, so if you look at, let's not talk about UC San Diego for a moment. Let's talk about the energy picture in this country. For the next 50 to 70 years, oil is not going away. Oil has to be part of the energy solution and equation in this country. Not only it has to be a part, you will find, you will see that the uh, total volume of crude, of oil and gas that we use, and coal, uh, coal is the other part, uh, is gonna increase, even though its percentage in the equation is reducing, right? So as more renewables come online, uh, the percentage of coal and oil will go down, but coal especially as a uh, 
absolute number will keep on increasing in volume in our usage. So the problem then is that if you take uh, the creation of crude from algae, that solves the transportation problem, but it does not quite solve uh, the problem of using creating energy, like for lighting and industrial use and so on and so forth. And that is more than half the energy used in the country, right? Uh, and sitting at UC San Diego, uh, I don't see a great strength in the coal area. And I don't see, for example, right now, an obvious way to build that strength. So I think as we look at the big problems this country is gonna face, we are gonna be missing out on what I would think of as a holistic solution because coal, I cannot imagine us having an energy future, at least in our lifetime without coal and without oil. That makes sense? So we at UC San Diego have to be focused uh, on other aspects. So an aspect where I think we have a great capability would be the smart grid, because in this future of uh, conventional and renewables all connected together, the only thing that's gonna put them together is the smart grid. And given our very strong competence and capability in computer science, electrical engineering, sensors, uh, and in Cal IT squared out here, I see us playing a very big role. But I have to tell you, and maybe I'm partly misinformed or ill-informed out here, but I think we are a little bit uh, behind in having a big initiative, a big effort in uh, smart grid. But we are not so far behind that we cannot catch up, all right? Uh, so I think that's an area I would be thinking of investing in. Uh, but probably not carbon sequestration would be another area which I think is very extremely, extremely relevant. But I don't see us playing a role just because of where we are and who we are. Does that kind of help? Okay. Great. Well, Thank you very much. I think we have run out of steam, so thanks a lot. Really. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wonderful talk. Thank you. I really, really enjoyed it. Thanks again. Just another round of applause here. Just a, I think a wonderful discussion. <laughs> Terrific. Uh, that concludes this evening. Uh, I, I'm not sure what time they actually close up. As long as you want. Okay, let's say nine, maybe nine twenty. There are twenty minutes here to to, to chat, and then we'll uh, we'll call it an evening. Thank you very much for coming.